it. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, I am Ivan. So this is the last lecture. Uh, so this is uh, Selberg race formula. So this is a continuation. Okay, so remember the setting was li like this and was a closed to the Riemannian manifold. It was a metric uh, constant curvature minus one. Metric of a constant curvature equals to minus one. So this is a this is what is usually called a hyperbolic surface, closed surface. So um, I mentioned that uh, these uh, general results imply that M is actually a quotient of upper half plane by, uh, by a group gamma, where gamma appears as inside the group of um, inside PSL2R. Uh, which is indeed a group of isometries, um, orientation preserving isometries. Of oh, this is the Poincare uh, upper half plane, right? So, so, it, so it, it is a discrete uh, subgroup, but it's not any discrete subgroup. First of all, it is co-compact. But then it is not any co-compact. Uh, the action is such that uh, there aren't any fixed points. So the, the quotient is smooth, that's important. So that puts some restrictions on gamma. They're called Fuchsian groups, but uh, right now it doesn't matter. But gamma on the other hand is actually equal to pi one of um, this M. Uh, with respect to some point x0, so a fundamental group. This is the fundamental group of this. And um, one of the nice things uh, about uh, this, uh, this fundamental group is, is that, of course, the conjugacy classes of gamma. So usually, I mean, for example, we can denote it by bracket gamma. That is in one one correspondence with three homotopy uh, classes of uh, free loop space. So this is the free loop space of M up to three homotopies. That's um, that's conjugacy classes, and of course we um, I proved this subgroup trace formula. So you know we had the general subgroup trace formula. Um, so this is general uh, because. Um, we started with, with a very general kernel. I mean, we fixed K, uh, basically, with, you know, some kind of nice rapid decay function 
an R to uh, from R or, or positive to R. And then um, we form this um, um, kernel Km, X and Y, using this K. It, it, it's, it's a kernel, and this kernel gave us an integral operator, right? on um, L2 of uh, basically M, 2 L2 of M. And then we computed the trace of these integral operators in two ways, and this was uh, this general uh, self right trace form. Um, so I, I'm gonna write it, but now, so I mean, okay. So one of the one of the things about it is very general because we started with a very general function k, right? So we started, and as a result, the spectrum of uh, this Laplacian of, of Laplacian of this manifold uh, is not uh, does not appear in, 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 the, in the trace formula. Uh, so this is not the exact analog of Poisson summation. I'm not Poisson, I mean the, this Jacobi inversion formula that we have. This is more like the analog of Poisson summation formula. But eventually we needed a, a, an identity between, remember in the case of tori, we need an identity between uh, you know, eigenvalues uh, of the Laplacian and lengths of closed geodesics, uh, which was some sort of duality between the two. So how to get, uh, how to get Laplacian into this picture now? That's what uh, uh, the kind of particular Selberg trace formula does for us. So to do this, we need to know um, the heat kernel for, uh, for this uh, upper half plane. Remember, we, for the case of torus, uh, we use the heat kernel of R2 as the universal cover, or Rn as the universal cover of uh, the torus, and then averaged it by the action of uh, Zn by, by one of the torus, and got the heat kernel on the quotient space. So we're going to do the same thing here, actually. So now the idea is uh, to take, uh, this particular um, um, heat kernel. So let's now, so this is a stop now, and let's start uh, now here, maybe. So heat kernel for um, H for this point gray upper half plane. Remember the Laplacian, so of course the metric here is two uh, and the covering is space H, which uh, is a metric of constant curvature minus one. It's uh, this metric, dx squared plus dy squared over y2. And remember the Laplacian of this metric is minus y2 um, d2 dx2 plus d2 dy2. This was the metric for, this is the Laplacian for, for this metric on H, right? Now you remember uh, that uh, the heat kernel for Rn, which was very important in, in, in the actual uh, trace formula for, um, for the torus was this. Uh, so this was K 
x, I don't know, I, I, I wrote t first or maybe t last, it doesn't matter. Well, it matters what I just, almost matters, I would say. This is four pi t minus n over two. I mean, in the case of uh, two dimensional total sense, of course, is equal to two. I mean, or two, so this is uh, now exponential of minus x minus y over 14. So this is the famous Gaussian, uh, which works for Rn. But of course, this does not work here. Uh, the Laplacian here is more complicated. Uh, the metric is not flat. So the question is, uh, so this is k of Rn. So the question is, what is this uh, heat kernel for, for that? Well, uh, this has been computed for quite some time. And it's the following function. So K of H, X, Y, T is equal to, um, Yes, is uh, exponential of minus t over four uh, root two times four pi t power t over two. Okay, integral um, d of x and y. Um, to infinity times the r e to the minus r2 over 14 over square root of cosh of r minus uh, cosh e of x and y, which is a constant, so this integral, and then there is dr. So, uh, well, d of x and y is, of course, the hyperbolic distance of uh, x and y. distance between x and y in the upper half plane. So this is, of course, it's a much more complicated function um, uh, because the metric, although it's constant curvature is highly symmetric, but metric is not uh, curvature zero, it's not flat. So anyhow, so uh, I won't tell you how this was obtained because this is a, um, this is a long story by itself. So uh, we just take it as uh, something that uh, been figured out, not for trace formula, but uh, for general um, questions. Um, can I ask a question? Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, earlier on, we had found an asymptotic heat kernel for general manifolds. Does that agree with this? The, uh, the, the, the asymptotics of heat kernel, uh, oh yes. Um, we, we, we had that there was, we approximated it with a Gaussian, uh, cent, uh, 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 roughly speaking, the, the, the e to the minus distance squared over 40 times some error terms, of, I think. Yes, yes, yes. Oh yeah, this uh, definitely, this uh, fits with that, but to check that again, you have to do a lot of work. Okay. I mean, it's not, uh, this is not, totally clear that it's going to be of that form. But you see some hints of the, but I mean, this is not, I mean, the, at the end, the cosh dxy will appear in the formula once uh, you approximate this integral or something, but yeah, that's, uh, it's not obvious, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so this is a this is this is a kind of story on its own, but uh, we don't uh, need to uh, use it. But this is in the upper half plane, right? So this is in the upper half plane, and this is the quotient mapping to our manifold. So this is the quotient map. 
So now uh, to get uh, the heat kernel here, we just average this heat kernel up here over the action of the fundamental group and we get this heat kernel here. So in this case, then Km, X and Y and T is equal to sum uh, KH X G Y um, T. Uh, well, G belongs to gamma, right? So this is the heat kernel uh, downstairs. Kernel in the base. Okay, so if you know the group gamma, you have this infinite series, and uh, this is a this is a good series. It's conversion. The function is a smooth in x, y, and t positive, and and remember we use this idea uh, in this case where we had a sum over um, z n. And then we have uh, these expressions, and then we put uh, x minus y minus a point of Zn right? for all points of Zn. So this is a generalization of this idea. And of course, it's uh, it's clear that uh, because these two manifolds are locally like each other, I mean, this function first of all goes to the quotient; it's invariant under the action. Uh, so in each variable goes to the quotient. And uh, if you want to apply this Laplacian, I mean Laplacian of M to this suffices to apply Laplacian of H because locally they are the same. And then uh, the fact that this is the heat kernel gives you that this is the heat kernel. So this is uh, what we have to have here. All right, now um, let, um, Lambda zero, which is zero always, less than lambda one, less than equal to lambda two, so on, um, be equal to this is the spectrum of Laplacian, I mean a scalar Laplacian on, on, on Mm. This is eigenvalue zero has multiplicity one because we are always assuming the manifold is connected. And the next eigenvalue lambda one, of course, is strictly positive. And I told you that actually Hoover and uh, maybe Silver, I think, maybe, but Hoover certainly uh, proved that uh, always in this case, lambda one is bigger than or equal to a quarter. And the way uh, they proved it as, is actually uh, they used uh, this trace formula that I'm going to. Um, I'm going to, uh, to, to, to to write down now. Okay, so once we have this, then we can apply that general trace formula, and the we see that um, the <clears throat> instead of getting that abstract trace of that operator KM. Uh, now this is a trace of an operator that's related to the spectrum. So, so I'm saying apply general trace formula to this KM. And uh, then we get um, trace of exponential of minus t Laplace of m, which of course from abstractly we know that this is sum uh, exponential of minus t lambda m and from zero to infinity. Uh, now the right hand side is interesting. It's equal to you know there were like two terms. Uh, one term correspond corresponded to conjugacy class of the identity element, which is a single term, and that single term was area of m, 
right? And then uh, the function uh, in this case is e to the minus t over four, four pi t, the power t over two, integral zero to infinity. You have to you have to calculate an integral, but that's not difficult. D e, e to the minus d squared over four t over sine hyperbolic of uh, one half b. TV. This is the term that corresponds to conjugate class of the identity and the kind of non trivial conjugate classes are uh, the following. Remember, we, we have this countable set of conjugate classes because the, the fundamental group, the group gamma is countable after all. Uh, we know it, it has two generators and one relation, so um, the, the group is, is countable. So the number of conscious classes is countable. And what we did in each conscious class, we picked a pre primitive element. The primitive element corresponds to a geodesic that cannot be written as multiple of another geodesic in that uh, conscious class. In other words, is not a repeat, several times repeat of another geodesic uh, of um, a shorter length, but in the same class, okay? So this is uh, this element P, and then there was this result that all other uh, geodesics are of the form P to the N. So basically the geodesics that live inside one conscious class are indexed by two parameters. One is this P, which is the primitive geodesic, and then N, which are repeats of this. So that's, uh, that's this next term. N from one to infinity, um, sum, uh, non-conjugate uh, primitive P. Elements and then the length of P over sinh of one half of Pn. Um, right, um, exponential of minus t over four, four by t. Half, and then that element exponential of minus uh, length of Pn. Um, whole thing squared divided by 14. Okay, so this needs a calculation using this general trace formula and using this, you have to calculate an integral explicitly from the general. So that's uh, more or less straightforward. So I won't uh, go into, into proving this. Just uh, uh, what is important now for us is the structure of uh, this trace, this, this formula. On the left-hand side is now the, the spectrum of the Laplacian. On the right-hand side, uh, the sum is over, um, It's not over conjugacy classes, really. It's more than that. It's over uh, these primitive elements, which, if you want, they label conjugacy classes. But inside each, also PN. Repeats of uh, geodesics also should be counted as many times as, as needed. So that's, uh, that's the summation that's, uh, that we need um, over there. Um, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, how do we know that the uh, uh, heat kernel is also the same as e to the minus t Laplacian? Heat kernel is, uh, oh, um, oh yes, that's um, right. That's uh, just 
simple uh, calculus thing. You see, um, I mean, formally, what you want to solve is the following equation, right? du dt is equal to minus Laplacian of u, right? And given that u of zero and x given, right? Basically, you want to solve this boundary value problem, right? And then, uh, of course, the, the, the formal solution of this u of t and x, if you want, is equal to exponential of minus t Laplacian times u zero. So this is your operator. Okay. And and the heat carrier is the I mean formally you can differentiate this with that, like like in calculus one, right? Mm -hmm. And the same idea is correct actually. So that's uh, so this works. Okay. Now uh, now uh, so the first application, which is not very important for us. Is actually Weyl's law. I mean, uh, but we already know that Weyl's law is true in much more generality. But imagine you didn't prove uh, Weyl's law. I mean, we derived it from some other fact which I didn't prove, but uh, using Tauberian theorem and that fact, I derived Weyl's law for general compact Riemannian manifold, right? But here also follows. So, um, Weyl's law. Weyl's law is, uh, is, is the following that n of lambda is uh, asymptotically given by C, uh, basically, um, area of M lambda as lambda goes to infinity. Remember, C is a constant which is independent of M. Uh, but then n of lambda is the eigenvalue, or I should say, was the eigenvalue counting function, right? So the number of uh, lambdas, uh, lambda i's, eigenvalues, uh, which is less than or equal to lambda. So this is the eigenvalue counting function. Value. Okay, and um, to, to, to just uh, to know that all, all you need to know using this formula, I mean, so just apply the tau variant theorem. To the fact that this trace Trace of uh, e to the minus t delta m um, asymptotically is given by this area using, I mean, these terms you can forget because, I mean, you can estimate that they don't, uh, the leading term is here, and this is asymptotically is given by uh, 4 by t, I mean, again, 4 pi doesn't matter, some constant. Another constant, C prime, is going to be t to the power uh, minus one as t goes to zero. Yeah, four pi t minus uh, n over two, n is two. Yeah, this is the one, right, as n goes to zero. So you see, the idea of Tauberian theorem was that if you can prove that this, this thing, which is after all, nothing but sum exponential of minus t lambda i, Right. Tauberian so theorem told us that if you have a sequence of uh, these lambda i's uh, such that as t goes to zero, the sum behaves like this. Of course, the sum has to blow up because uh, as t goes to zero, this is trace of the identity operator, so which is infinite. But how is it infinite like this? Then immediately Tauberian theorem tells you that the number of these lambda i's is going to be uh, estimated like this. And there's a, there's a 
I mean, the, the formula is general. It is like t to the power alpha. There's some constant. There is another power of uh, lambda here, and then there is that constant times gamma function and some some combination. So that's uh, that's the that was the idea, right? It's in your notes. So comparing this, this is as I said, is not important because these are the uh, terms that actually doesn't go to zero. They are like O of one, little O even of one. So they don't contribute and then that's it. So you can derive y as well if you want from this. Um, this is in a way um, one form of the asymptotic expansion, but uh, it's, 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 it's not um, the way we want because uh, information is very geometric. Uh, in the asymptotic ex expansion, we wanted information to be kind of clearly expressed. So, but nevertheless, that's uh, what, so that's, uh, but that's, that's not the point of this uh, result because people knew that this is correct anyhow. The thing that, the thing that that's important is now the fact that Length spectrum and spectrum determine each other. So that's one of the now first things that uh, these people noticed. Um, so let me just define for our M and G. Remember, this is a hyperbolic surface and G is metric of constant curvature minus one, right? Uh, the length spectrum of G is the set of such numbers uh, L of Qs, where Q uh, moves over the distinct uh, conjugacy classes. So distinct. Q, I mean, belongs to, so these are conjugacy classes. So, and what is L of Q? L of Q, of course, we have a formula for that, uh, which is always used. L of Q is equal to two whose hyperbolic inverse function of one half trace of Q. So this was the notation, by the way, I mean, this is notation of McKean. Um, so the, the, I mean, this notation makes perfect sense because if you have a conscious class uh, in gamma, uh, the, the elements are either conjugate to each other, in that case, trace doesn't matter, or um, because you see gamma is inside PSL bar, or they could be plus minus one. But if it is plus minus one, then this trace is plus minus one, but cos hyperbolic function inverse is, 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 is an even function, so it again doesn't matter. So, so this is no matter what is well defined, it just depends on the conjugacy class. Okay, so you could put absolute value, but it, it's not needed because this is independent. So that's, uh, that's and, and now um, the meaning of this, of course, is the length of the geodesic of smallest length in that free homotopy uh, class. So this is the length of the closed geodesic of the smallest length in the uh, free homotopy class defined by Q. Because we know that the set of, as I said at the beginning, the set of consciousness classes correspond to this free um, 
I mean, three homotopy classes of uh, uh, three loops. Uh, and then, okay, so in, in each there exists a unique one, which we denoted by P, which has the smallest uh, length. And that's this one is given. This, this was a calculation. This is a calculation in hyperbolic uh, geometry. And it's essentially elementary. That's not no analysis needed for that. Okay, so these are these numbers and the spectrum, and these numbers are here, here, by the way. These are the numbers that appear here. But uh, it's, there is a complication because also L of PNs, uh, I mean, there's, there's another summation here. Uh, so now the other spectrum is on the left hand side, right? Uh, so so that's the uh, Laplace spectrum. Of course, we should compare this with Laplace spectrum. Laplace spectrum. So this Laplace spectrum, of course, is the set of lambda ends, right? That's what we have been dealing with. Now, this result here shows that they determine each other in a unique way, okay? So the result of um, Uber and um, and uh, and Silver is that. So let me write it here because I don't want to erase that again because I mean. So a plus spectrum. And length spectrum determine each other. So this is exactly now like the situation uh, that we had. So we should compare. So now the argument is that uh, so proof. So let's uh, see why Laplace implies uh, length. Laplace spectrum determines length spectrum. Let's do that first. So we have this guy on the left hand side, and we want to know that if we know this function. Uh, for a T positive on the left hand side, then we know this function. And by Boyle's law, the area of the thing is completely determined in terms of this thing, anyhow, right? So you can delete this part from both sides of the formulas for M and M prime. And then this sum for M corresponds to the same sum for M prime, right? And then the argument uh, is quite similar to. Um, then um, um, compare. So let, let me just give you the, the case of compare with the uh, torus argument. This was the abelian case. So in that case, remember the formula that we had was this that sum of um yeah for for the torus it was that sum of yeah it was like exponential of minus four pi squared uh i believe maybe lambda uh squared t uh lambda belongs to your lattice gamma oh actually gamma star yeah so this is equal to, um, well, I mean, it was like, uh, even was very general volume of M uh, over, um, uh, I believe, um, four by T to the N over two, and then we had some sum, 
exponential of minus. Um, uh, okay, so maybe here I say, yeah, I think lambda star, lambda star, and then maybe over lambda squared over 40. In this case, the lambda belongs to gamma itself, right? Just make sure that the coefficient is correct. Yeah, that's uh, that's absolutely correct. Uh, so I'm in two dimensional case, so I just delete that. So this is this one, and this is area now. Okay, all right. So now we have two things here equal to these things. Then uh, what is the argument? So you say that, okay, first of all, um, we deleted uh, the constant term, which is like here. So this is equal to area of M over four pi T, which you can cancel because of Y's law plus some uh, lambda different from zero now, non-trivial uh, consciously classes. Which in this case, just non zero points in the, in, in, in the lattice itself uh, belonging to gamma. Now, then, um, if two such sums want to be equal, so let's uh, say L1 be equal to smallest non zero length. Uh, in the collection of lengths, uh, whatever uh, lambda uh, different from zero belonging to gamma, right? Now, the thing is, this smallest uh, length may appear several times because there may be, I mean, the lattice, for example, imagine you have a, like a square lattice, this is, so this is the um, origin deleted because of Y's law, just you can get rid of that. And then you have four points that give you the same length. And as you move on, uh, you may have many points that have the same length and then, so you can list the whole uh, set of lengths in the length spectrum uh, like this, so starting from this. And now if two such functions want to be the same, then you easily convince yourself, because this is true for any t, you easily convince yourself that the only way that these two to be the same is that they should be uh, same, they should have same minimal length, and the multiplicity of that minimal length both should be the same. Otherwise, these two functions cannot be the same. So after you convince yourself of, of that, then you just delete, we just deleted uh, these minimal lengths, and then we are left with sequence, another series of length, and then we argue that. Similar thing can argue like here. Just uh, don't be uh, fooled by these functions. I mean, these functions you can, you can easily um, work with and mimic this argument over there. So I'm just uh, giving you the details here, but here it's also quite similar. So this is this direction. And of course, the other direction is even more obvious. I mean, the other direction that length spectrum determines the spectrum is quite obvious because these two functions, you know, for two sequences of lambda ends to be the same, then those sequences of lambda ends have to be the same. There's no way any of them could be different from the other. So, uh, it's not easier. So having this result, then um, it was not difficult to uh, get this. But, but remember, I mean, now the, the result is remarkable because it extended to, to these hyperbolic surfaces now. Um, Hygiene's uh, constant curvature um, curves of these surfaces, complex curves. Uh, the result that we only had for torus before. So now this is a result, at least in this case, we have for all torus. So that's one thing. Now, what I want to 
Okay, yes, there is another thing which is absolutely fundamental they did. Uh, so this is all maybe is due to Hooper or Selberg or both. I mean, certainly Hooper, but maybe Selberg also. So let me, I think it's due to both. So any questions? I'm wondering like, uh, uh, how, how true this mutual determination is for manifolds more general than uh, like uh, the, the that setting we have now? Yeah, I, th I think this question, um, this question has, has been addressed. I think it's, um, I think it has been, I, th I think it has been generalized to Riemannian manifold in some things, uh, which they need not be constant curvature even. They must have some generic condition. Uh, so th there is a, so yeah, so you, you, should, you should read this result by Gilliman. I don't want to recall it because I don't remember the exact formulation. So I don't want to tell you something which is not exact. So there is a Gilliman uh, booster marked And then you should also check the result of Kalindu DA. They have very general results, which is in, in, in the spirit of these trace formulas. Of course, they don't have exact trace formulas. They have asymptotic trace formulas, but uh, essentially, um, I think they can, they can, they can make some such correspondences, I think. Yeah. Thanks, I, I am reading those there. They, I find it quite impenetrable, but I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, these, are, these are wonderful papers, right? But these are, uh, yeah, anyway, right. So they are doing, so yeah, I mean, we can discuss that later, right? That's, that's the reference. The modern reference for these things, uh, okay, so let me not think now because, now, the thing that's very important is a kind of a prime geodesic theorem. Oh, uh, okay, so let me not erase that again. So, so prime geodesic theorem. So what is it? So let, let's define a function like uh, n, is it n? Yeah, so like a function like n of x. Yeah, I mean, why not n of x? Could it be the number of uh, primitive elements P? Um, well, okay, so I better write it like this number of P such that L of P less than or equal to X and P is a primitive geodesic. Uh, P is a So what is it? So we know that this set is just countable, right? You have to look at different context classes and you find geodesic of minimal length there. These are called primitive geodesics and count the number of such geodesic whose length is less than equal to this. Then this result of uh, Huber, uh, Selberg is that n of x is actually asymptotic to e to the x over x as x goes to infinity. Okay, so that's this uh, called prime geodesic theorem. So now we should compare this with prime number theorem. So in that case, we have this function pi of x, prime counting function into notation, I believe is due to Riemann, is the number of primes less than or equal to x. And this prime number theorem said that, remember uh, it said that uh, pi x 
is equal to x over log x as x goes to infinity. It's also asymptotic to lead uh, logarithmic integral of x, which is integral e to x dt over log t. Well, the point is that this function uh, is, of course, asymptotic to this. That's elementary, you can check. But it turns out that this is a better approximation to pi than x over log x. But anyhow, asymptotically, they are the same. Uh, so now you see that uh, here x is like log of this one. Yeah. So the relation between 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 uh, the size of this prime number and the length of geodesic is of log. So yeah. So right. So if you take length of this geodesic, you get uh, the corresponding thing for prime numbers, which is this. I mean, log of the length is this. There is also a formula for a number of conscious classes whose length is less than equal to exactly by the same formula. Now they derive this from this trace formula and uh, oh, uh, okay, so I just say apply trace formula, I mean separate trace formula. I mean you can read this proof in, in my key, for example. There is also a very nice proof by Peter Buter. I highly recommend uh, for um, geometry of uh, hyperbolic surfaces. Uh, this is spectral theory of hyperbolic surfaces. This is kind of one of the best surfaces uh, for in, in the compact case, in the compact case, which is what we are doing here. So I won't go into this because, uh, yeah, you have to get a little bit, I mean, in the analysis, but it, it's not. Uh, it's not bad at all. So this is, uh, I mean, depends really. Okay, you can say that uh, proving the separate trace formula needed a lot of argument, a lot of ideas, yes. But I would say still is less complicated than proof of prime number theorem, uh, which uh, is this result. Uh, um, I would think so. I would say it's it's less complicated than uh, proof of prime number theorem. At least the original proof of PNT was quite a lot of work. So um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah. Okay, so that's uh, that's one thing. But now the main thing that I want to finish with is uh, the Selberg zeta function, which. Uh, and actually, you know, I mean, so this is the first step towards the Riemann hypothesis, right? I mean, Riemann hypothesis is refinement of this in the sense that it gives you the correction uh, to this. So, okay, prior to as asymptotic to this, but what is the remainder term? And it, it has a proposal for the remainder which follows from Riemann hypothesis. In this case, also, there is a Riemann hypothesis, but the thing is, in this case, it actually was proved. <laughs> so let me just write it. Uh, center zeta function now. And uh, Riemann, uh, and and Riemann hypothesis. For geodesics. Okay. So again, our settings is like in G as today. Surface constant curvature um, compact and constant curvature um, Riemannian hyperbolic surface. Now, 
what is uh, this uh, server trace? Uh, I mean, server data function. So this server data function is the following function: z m s is equal to product n from one to infinity product over p a one minus p to the power minus s uh, plus k. Uh, should be L of P, of course. Um, no, no, no. I, well, let me know. It's better to write that E, sorry. Exponential minus that term times length of P Oh, wow. Okay. So here is P actually, summation. And here is K if you want to. Right. Okay. Right. 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 So um, this is this is the cell uh, Of course, I mean again, you should compare this with compare with uh, the Euler product formula for zeta function. Remember, we had two definition of zeta function. One of them was this was product of one minus p to the minus s minus one. So here we are not inverting, but uh, otherwise you see the similarity. And then here we didn't have this factor k, we just had over p. Now, here, what is p? P is, uh, I mean, p belongs to the set of uh, prime geodesics, right? Geodesics of ng, right? So if you want, uh, basically, this is an infinite product over all geodesics up to uh, free homotopy of paths. I mean, if two geodesics are homotopic to each other, uh, we don't care. I mean, you just take one. For each class, we get one. But then in, in that class, you have to take all powers of this. So this is a, this is a really, an infinite product over the set of all closed geodesics, lengths of, I mean, all closed geodesics up to free homotopy. And this was the uh, Euler product formula for zeta, which of course, it was originally defined like this, but then Euler noticed this. Now we have this, but we don't have anything like that here. We just have this, that's one thing. Now, the main, uh, so, okay, not the main, but I mean, the first question now is, of course, where this sum is convergent. And I say that this is actually convergent for, obviously, for real part of S bigger than one. I mean, this is convergent. And of course, it's polymorphic there. Start with here. Uh, to prove this, we just have to use uh, the criterion for convergence of infinite products. What we have to do, we have to show that sum over P sum K of these numbers. And P's, right? Uh, this is infinite, right? Because we know that if this, this sum is convergent, the infinite product is convergent and it's, it's, it's if and only if. Okay, but this we can estimate uh, using uh, prime geodesic theorem for, uh, for these guys, right? So this is equal to, first of all, you can calculate that this is, I mean, what you can do, um, you can sum over K and then you get a geometric series like this. So you get sum and then you can sum over K, you get sum over P then exponential of 
minus s l of p over one minus e to the minus length of p. Uh, this is the geometric. This is this part remains, but the other one is geometric series uh, that we use. But of course, this is less than c. Um, you see, these lengths increase, and p is a non-trivial uh, conjugate class, anyhow. So um, we just look at um, um, I mean sum over p exponential of minus s l of p. Now this you can write it as uh, some sort of still just integral. So c integral zero to infinity e to the minus s of x dnx. Well, n is this prime geodesic counting function, right? And using the fact that it, it was of that form, so this is convergent. For real part of s bigger than one. Now, this is important for real part of s. Remember, n of x was asymptotically of the form uh, e to the x over x. If you use this towards this, you can show that for real part of s bigger than one, this is convergent. So this, uh, this theory, I mean, this infinite product really defines the holomorphic function um, for um, real part of s bigger than one to start. Now, the goal is this. We are going to show that this function is actually holomorphic everywhere in the complex plane. There, there are no singularities of this function. And we're going to find uh, the order of all of its zeros. Okay. So let me now write down. And show that ms is holomorphic. In other words, it's an entire function in C. I mean, it has a actually uh, holomorphic extension to the whole complex plane without any uh, singularities, without any poles, and we find the order of all of its zeros. And we find its orders of orders of its zeros. Because the um, Riemann hypothesis has to do with the location of zeros of Riemann zeta function, non trivial zeros. So we are going to do the same thing here and show uh, where the non trivial zeros are located and then uh, move from there. So that's, that's the idea. Okay. Now, the, how did we prove? Again, it's a good idea to compare with the, with the Riemann uh, zeta function. How did we prove that Riemann zeta function? Remember, Riemann zeta function was this, right? Um, originally defined for real part of S bigger than one. How did we prove that this is actually uh, has whole, has has metamorphic extension to the whole complex plane? And uh, we started analyzing some of its zeros at least. How did we do that? Well, we did it uh, by bringing in theta function, right? So, so we used Melin transform. Plus theta function. You see, we, so for example, one of the original formulas we used was lambda to the power minus S equal to one over gamma of S integral zero to infinity uh, e to the minus t, I mean lambda t, uh, t to the s over t dt, and then we sum over these things and somehow magically uh, theta function appears inside and then we started analyzing the integral and using identities for theta function. So something similar to this 
separate d for this function, but it's just a bit more complicated. So he had to be really tricky. And of course, he was a master um, analyst and mathematician, supreme mathematician. Of course. So, um, so then what Selberg did, he said that uh, consider uh, the log trilogy. Uh, you, still on real part of S bigger than one. Remember, this function is not zero on real part of S bigger than one because it's an infinite product and this sum is less than infinite. So this is never zero on the real part of S bigger than one. So you can do this calculation Z prime of M. I mean, sorry, Z prime of S. So let's just denote this by ZS over ZS. Which is the log derivative of this. You can uh, show that this is equal to 2s minus 1, integral 0 to infinity, uh, e to the minus s times s minus 1 times t, theta of t, uh, dt. Uh, maybe I should put this theta in quotation mark, but yeah, doesn't matter. But this function theta t is the following function. It basically, um, you just take some, it's, I mean, you just take the partition, a spectral partition function, which is minus this one. And okay, so I'll go back here then. Uh, but now, then you have to subtract the trivial term from this uh, thing. So, which is the trivial term was the term that gave us voice of area of n divided by 4 pi t to the power 2 over 2 integral 0 to infinity uh, and then d e to the minus d2 over 40 over sinh as before, of course, sinh uh, one half d, and this is db. You see, when we did it here, and remember what was the next step? We said that we are going to sum. I mean, here we just chose um, n to the power minus s to get sum one over n to the s. And from one to infinity, so lambda is different from zero, is equal to one over gamma of s integral zero to infinity sum exponential of minus nt. Now it goes from one to infinity, right? t to the s over t dt. Then uh, Riemann's idea was that, okay, so this for him, the theta function was this function. Some exponential, of, I mean, this is the Jacobi theta three, but this is theta function anyhow, pi n squared t, right? N belongs to z. Okay, now uh, here, um, this n squared you can produce here, that's not the problem, by, by going to s over two and n two here. So if you just do s over two and two, so you get s over two, and here you get n two, uh, because, uh, yeah, you have n2 now, and then s over 2, and so on. And pi is not an issue. We can also produce a pi here. Uh, but, but the problem is you have to subtract the trivial part, which is 1, right? Here, there is a term that n equal to 0 here gives you 1. If you didn't subtract this, this integral uh, would be problematic at infinity. They wouldn't be. You have to do the same thing here. And the nature of subtraction is exactly the same. You just subtract the constant term. And here also, this is the constant term corresponding to uh, trivial conjugate class. Okay. You do that, and then this is uh, more or less a straightforward calculation from it. Now uh, you can expand this and derive some uh, amazing uh, conclusions from this calculation. So this is the justification. 
And now I erase this part. So using trace formula, again now because uh, uh, we have an expression for this and subtract that, so using trace formula. Uh, can replace, uh, so let's call this, now uh, this one, the right hand side, so let's call this a star, right hand side of the star, is, okay, so the right hand side comes out, be equal to yes, sum n from one to infinity, n from zero to infinity. Oh, there is actually, uh, sorry, there should be. Oh, no, oh, no, that's that's okay. I, I'm fine. This is n from zero to infinity, one over s times s minus one, minus lambda n, minus area of n, over four pi, times one over s plus n. This calculation so far uh, le legitimate only in real part of the speaker than one. Of course, we have no right of considering this function so far uh, for real part of s equal to one or less than one. But this is this calculation is, is, is I mean, the series is convergent and everything is fine. Now, the result that we need is that there is a relation between uh, poles of this and zeros and poles of z. This is uh, like a uh, complex analysis, right? Just uh, elementary complex analysis. Shows what? Shows that, um, okay, for example, if, um, so the orders of, Poles and zeros of um, S is given by um, residues of uh, Z prime S over Z S. at its poles. I mean, first of all, um, this function, if it has a pole, it's going to be simple for only when the system is simple. Let me, let me just, I mean, this is very simple, complex. I mean, this is, this is calculus. Uh, why? Because, you see, if you have a function, imagine your function like, that there is, imagine you have a general function, it doesn't have to do with, Partition function or z or anything uh, z of function. If you have a function which is of this of, of the form s minus alpha, for example, to the power n, imagine n is bigger than equal to one. It's, it's, it's a zero of order n. And if you look at this around this point, what kind of uh, singularity you get over there? You get uh, n over um, s minus alpha, right? So, you, so a zero of z of order n produces a positive residue who's, uh, who's actually, I mean, up to one over two pi or something. This is just a positive integer number. Now, if you have s minus alpha to the power of minus n, you would have exactly the same thing, but then the sentence would be negative. And that's it. 
So basically, uh, by looking at residues of this, you can tell um, whether this function, and this is a very general idea, we will use data and also survey. Uh, you can tell where, uh, where the, um, if this function has any, any pores, and if there are zeros, what are the orders of zeros? So that's one idea. And we can just read it from here because the residue, I mean, the, the, the poles of this function are exactly at the, at, these are fractions, right? It's a kind of infinite fraction expansion and the poles are here and zeros of this. And there is also uh, this uh, possibly, yeah, this, this doesn't contribute anything. So, so we have to analyze this now. Okay, so that's a very basic general idea. Now, another thing that we need to get rid of that term area is the following. So you use Gauss point Uh, so what was Gauss when I just said that one over two pi, right? Integral curvature, the, the area over M is equal to Euler characteristic of M, which is two minus two H. So I just denote the, uh, the uh, genus for, by H, this is the genus. And this is Euler characteristic, right? Okay, but this is surface of constant curvature minus one. So this is equal to minus area of M over two pi is equal to two minus two H. And H is, is a non-negative integer, right? I mean, actually H is bigger than equal to two. Let's not, I mean, okay. So we have got that equal to two minus two H. All right, so then what we have, we have that minus area of M equal to four pi times one minus H. Okay, so here I can replace area. So this becomes one minus H. Uh, okay, so there is a negative, negative becomes positive. So this is one minus H now. Correct. Minus area of M, I believe I erased. It's this one, right? Yeah, and, and of course, H is bigger than equal to two. So this number, this whole number is positive, right? Because H is bigger than equal to two, there's negative, negative makes it positive. So this is a positive integer. Uh, so this is a positive integer. And this guy also, so now I can tell that this function um, has residues positive at those points. So now we can analyze. Okay, I can erase this. Okay. So poles. Uh, right hand side. First of all, there are zeros of this function. There's a first of all, non trivial uh, simple roots. Of the M. Are at um, one half plus minus the square root of one half minus the lambda n. Oh, lambda n uh, is, is the end eigenvalue. Uh, and remember uh, that there was an estimate that I did not prove, but I mentioned several times. Lambda, lambda n is bigger than equal to. Okay, so this is for n. So this, let's. Um, so well, I mean, there are two two types of terms on the right hand side. N 
uh, P equal to one and n equal to zero. We are analyzing them separately. The first call for n P equal to two. So where so okay so this guy the zeta function has simple roots at here one half plus one is this guy. So now. Um, this is half. So these are pure imaginary numbers and appear in pairs. Oh, by the way, at this stage, this expansion shows that the function can be extended metamorphically to the whole complex plane. I mean, this is um, um, so first, so there are these roots here, right? They correspond to n bigger than one. These roots here correspond to negative integers in terms one over s plus n give um, multiple roots. multiple, I mean, first of all, these are called trivial roots, and there are also multiple roots of Zm s at s equal to minus n. You see, this function, of course, has, has poles, uh, simple poles at s equal to minus n, but the coefficient is big than equal to two. I mean, I wrote one, but this is bigger than no, 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 yeah, yeah, bigger than to one. Bigger than one. Which is, if h is two, is the top, okay, so one, yes. Um, yeah, okay, so if, if the genus is true, then uh, these trivial roots are simple. Uh, the genus is bigger than two, the trivial roots are not. Uh, so multiple, I just declare like that, right. Now, the case uh, n equal to zero gives uh, some other roots. So let me make sure that I haven't forgotten them. Yes. I can erase this part. n equal to zero produces, I mean, right hand side. Imagine, you see, remember lambda zero is zero. And this is also one over s, produces um, yes, simple roots at s equal to one. And uh, a trivial H code root H is the genus at s equal to zero. I mean, this is also obvious because here uh, you get one over s times s minus one plus h minus one over s. So if you look at this term, uh, there are uh, poles at s zero and s equal to one. And the, if you write it again in terms of partial fraction decomposition, you get these two numbers. So that's um, with that. So these are all the, um, all the roots of uh, the celebrated zeta function. So now, um, so there are no other roots because if there was any other root, the log derivative, you know, so the prime s over zs, you had any other poles, well, there are no poles. If there are any other roots, uh, it would show here as simple poles here, but we don't have anything. 
Okay. So now the corollary of this is that, of course, now this, this has proved the uh, Riemann hypothesis for this function. So, so the corollary was that Riemann hypothesis. Uh, to, I mean, holds for the, the self Zeta function in the sense that uh, all the non trivial zeros of this function is on the critical line, and there is a trivial zero at s equal to zero, and there are trivial zeros at s equal to. Uh, minus uh, n for different integers. So remember, and there are no other zeros. So if you compare this with Riemann zeta function, of course, um, with zeta s, you see there are trivial zeros. At S equal to negative two n, n equal to uh, one, two, three. So at negative even integers, there are zeros, uh, simple zeros. And uh, Euler product formula is, uh, shows that there are no zeros here. And functional equations show that there are no zeros here, except these points. But what we don't know is that all of the zeros are on the critical line. But in this case, we do know, thanks to this very uh, kind of careful analysis that is available in this case, uh, because there is this uh, magical trace formula, several trace formula that gives us that. Now, before I finish, let me just wait and see if there are any questions. Yes. Okay. So now one question is that, okay, so now you prove that uh, all zeros are here, simply proof that all zeros are here, so what? No, so the, the point is that here, then, um, the point of this business of zeros is that there are general results by some general complex analysis results. Let me put it like this, by some general results. Let me just put it like this. Um, if you know the zeros, It gives you precise information about this uh, prime geodesic uh, function. So this, uh, remember in the case of Riemann zeta function, it said that pi of x is asymptotic to li x is actually equal to uh, li x plus O of x half log x, right? So it gives you exactly the order of the remainder term, which is of this form. Uh, there is a similar result in this case. So here we get nx is equal to e to the x over x plus some very explicit remainder term, which I don't remember right now, but it gives you exactly a, a, a good count on the number of geodesics whose length is less than or equal to uh, from geodesics whose length is less than or equal to x. So that's the, that's the value, that's the reason that you're interested in zeros of uh, Selberg zeta. This is Selberg zeta, and this is um, Riemann zeta, the two kings. So the philosophy for both cases are simple. Okay, now one more thing. Uh, let me just. Uh, Actually, two more things uh, before. I mean, it's just five, ten minutes will be done. But let 
that we now that we have come this far that we now mentioned. One of them was, of course, this functional equation for zeta function. Again, let's recall. For Selberg zeta function, I mean, uh, so we call for zeta so it was that z now this z is not that z at all z of uh, one minus s equal to z s right. So, well, in this case, the complete uh, zeta function was pi to the power minus s over 2, gamma of s over 2, zeta of s, right? It was this. Okay, so this was, uh, this is in Riemann. Now, for this, uh, so the theorem is that, in fact, for Selberg also, something like this is true, set m. One minus s equal to z m s times a function. Um, that function is um, not a bad function. It's exponential of two times uh, I mean the genus of the surface h minus one integral from zero to s minus half. Um, yes, that's s minus half pi x tangent hyperbolic pi x dx. Okay, proof. Okay, so you see the structure of the Functional equation is almost like this, but not quite, because there is this term, multiplicative factor, that has to be there. So it's a function of S also. Um, yeah, OK. I mean, so in terms of zeta function also, there are factors, you see, because we just, we just tricked ourselves. We just wrote it in terms of this function. If you, if you want to write functional equation in terms of zeta itself, you get something like this. You get a factor. So this is a kind of clean way of writing. I mean, you, you can perhaps do a similar thing here and write it as some z tilde one minus s equal to z tilde s for several z, but there's no point. So the, the, yeah, the, the nature of these two functional equations are exactly this. How do you prove this? Well, we have an expansion uh, for uh, log that, right? We know that z prime ms over z. I mean, okay, so yeah, I, I write m because of that. It was equal to that, some n equal to zero to infinity. Well, okay, so let me write it here. I'm going to be lazy now, so it's equal to this, right? This is a star. Now, this star is kind of nice because it's an almost an odd function. So, star is almost. I mean, odd under change of s to one minus s. So <clears throat> immediately you can conclude that I can raise this. So you can immediately conclude that z prime m one minus s over z prime over z m one minus s plus it's odd z. Ms over Zms is not zero, but is is a very well known function. Is equal to two times h minus one times s minus half 
and this very well known function, which is sum n minus infinity to plus infinity, one over s minus n. It's a it's a it's an elementary derivation going from here to here. Okay, so can you tell me what function is this function? Of course, you have to interpret this. You see, this is not a usual uh, thing. You know, I mean, if you sum uh, right hand side, this is not convergent. If you sum to left hand side, to minus infinity is not convergent. This is a convergent. Uh, for example, if you go from minus k to k. And then let k go to infinity. In that sense, this is converted. But now, in that sense, can you tell me which function is this? Yeah, it's um, it's uh, it's you see, this function has poles at s equal to n at all integers except. Um, All integers during in zero as well. Yeah. Well, what function has poles at all integers? Can you give me a function whose poles are integers? One over one minus e to the i t. So, so, uh, e to the i two pi t. Uh, so I believe. Uh, well, I, I don't want. So I believe that's really, I mean, the simplest function is tangent of pi x, right? Oh, okay. I mean, uh, tangent of y, I mean, uh, tangent of pi x. Uh, I think it's equal to tangent. Is tangent of pi over 2 infinite? Yeah, it is infinite. So I need pi over two or something, huh? Two pi? I've got tangent of pi x dx. Um, oh, s minus half. There is s minus half. S minus half this. I've got tangent of. Yeah, I've got, um, yeah, I think yeah, I've got something like this now. Which bothers me because this is equal to, so yeah, this is okay. Uh, as I said, you have to interpret this uh, in the right way, but then this is equal to two times H minus one. I've got the um, pi s tangent of uh, pi s. Yeah. S minus, oh, sorry, S minus half. Uh, no, S minus half is there already. I've got pi as tangent of pi, so I don't know why. Because the uh, tangent to me, uh, it has uh, a decibel to half has um, is infinite, so it has simple poles at those points. Um, okay, so anyhow, I'm not sure here, so I have to. But I believe the result is stated correctly, but I don't know how. Oh, yes, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, 
No, no, I had it different in my notes. This is equal to, yes, that's why. This is equal to pi x tangent of <laughs> pi x, where x is equal to s minus half, which is correct, of course. <laughs> yes. So um, then you just, uh, you have to integrate this, okay. Then integrate. Once you identify this infinite sum as uh, tangent of pi s minus half times tangent of pi s minus half, uh, then you just uh, integrate. Um, and then you get that you have this functional equation uh, that I, I wrote z1 minus s equal to z s. Of course, I mean, if you integrate, you get log of this uh, z minus s plus log of z s equal to that. Then the exponential, you get this multiplicative thing, which is this one. That's obvious. Uh, we have got times exponential of, as I wrote before, 2h minus 1 uh, integral from 0 to s minus half, now pi x tan of pi x dx, yes. So this is the functional equation for server example. So, I mean, this is not the last thing you, you can say about uh, length spectrum and uh, Laplace spectrum of these things. I mean, there is a lot uh, that is still one can drive from Selby Chris formula. But now, the last thing, the really, I said two things. So, now the very last thing is the following What happens to the uh, spectral zeta function, our good old zeta function? Uh, so back to good old zeta n was actually nothing but one over lambda n to the power s, right? Uh, lambda n is different from zero, non zero eigenvalues. I mean, yeah, that's like. By my enumeration, n goes from one to infinity, right? So that's all. Uh, so about this, by general results, we know that we have a long time ago. Uh, this function also has a meromorphic extension, uh, but it has a pole. Is meromorphic. I mean, it has a metamorphic extension. I mean, first of all, this is convergent immediately after Boyle's law for real part of S bigger than one, like uh, several zeta, uh, but uh, it's metamorphic uh, with a unique pole, which is actually simple. at s equal to one. Uh, and a residue of this uh, by, again, general results. Is only characteristic or is it genus? Uh, which one is it? Um, it's related to that. Yeah, it's actually h minus one. Okay, so so this much we you know without uh, as 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 a general fact. But what is not known, I believe, still is not known, is that if this zeta function has a functional equation or not. Like silver. Mm 
Let me see. In the case of Selberg, uh, we had that beautiful trace formula, and then uh, there was this functional equation that would be derived. Uh, of course, Riemann zeta has functional equation. I mean, I don't know. The expectation that we should have, because this also corresponds to a very symmetric object, which is a you know symmetric space, hyperbolic space of constant curvature minus one. So there should be something like that, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe it is known, but uh, I don't know. So I think now it's a good point to stop uh, the um, the thing is now.